North Korea is the impossible state. It's a place that stumped leaders and policymakers for more than three decades. It has a complex history, and it has become the United States' top national security priority. Each week on this show, we'll talk with the people who know the most about North Korea. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Impossible State podcast at CSIS. My name is Victor Cha. I'm Senior Vice President and Korea Chair at CSIS and Professor at Georgetown University. Uh, and on the Impossible State this week, we're actually going to talk about North Korea. In the past few episodes, we've been talking about a variety of different things, but we'll be talking about North Korea with our good friend, Andrew Yeo. Andrew is the Senior Fellow at, at the Foreign Policy Center for East Asian Policy Studies. Do I have that right? Yes, that's <laughs> correct. And SK Korea Foundation Chair in Korean Studies at the Brookings Institution just down the street from CSIS. Um, he's also a professor of politics at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. His most recent book is State, Society, and Markets in North Korea, published by Cambridge University Press in 2021, a book that I have read and enjoyed very much. He's also the author and editor of a number of other books, uh, Asia's Regional Architecture, uh, North Korea Human Rights, uh, Activist Alliances and Anti-U.S.-Based Protests, uh, and Living in an Age of Mistrust, an Interdisciplinary Study of Declining Trust in Contemporary Society and Politics, and How to Get It Back. Oh, very interesting. Um, he's also a prolific author in a number of journals, academic and policy journals, uh, including International Studies Quarterly, EJIR. For those of you who do IR, you will, you will recognize all these acronyms. For those of you who don't do IR, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll be able to live on. Uh, comparative politics, uh, obviously, others as well, the Washington Post, foreign affairs, foreign policy. So um, somebody who really operates both at the <clears throat> nexus of scholarship and policy. And so, Andrew, it's really good to have you with us today. Thanks. It's wonderful to be here. And let me congratulate you on the swag. I see the mugs now here. <laughs> and the last time I was here, it was just a podcast. It was a year ago. And now you have this on YouTube, so that's that's terrific. Yeah, that's that's sort of the new innovations, and actually increased our uh, our viewership uh, quite a bit. Right, it's actually I, more than doubled it. So I had talked about podcasts when I was in Korea, and some of our donors they were saying, "Do do people listen to podcasts?" So I think in Korea, the YouTube is much bigger than doing yeah, podcasts. Yeah. You definitely get a bigger reach. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going on YouTube yeah. if you go outside of the U.S. Yeah. Well, I'm, well, um, well. Thanks, thanks for that, and we're we're really happy that we're doing this both as podcast and as YouTube. Um, but I know your schedule is quite busy today, so let's get get right into it. Um, there are a couple of things we wanted to discuss. Uh, of course, the news the past week has been the uh, the I don't know what the right term to use is, but this um, movement by a U.S. Uh, Army soldier across the MDL, the military demarcation line, in, in an area called the Joint Security Area, or JSA, in Panmunjom. <clears throat> um, a movement by him across to the North Korean side uh, during a tour. He was on a civilian tour of the area uh, and then dashed across the line. That in a way that uh, you know, I'm sure nobody uh, expected. So, I mean, for our our listeners, our viewers, maybe you could first tell us a little bit, Andrew, about what happened there, and then we can talk sure. about what what. Well, Mary this story there. is appropriate appropriate for the impossible state because this is really something that was quite impossible to happen. I mean, someone did it, but it's not something you hear every day. But an army private, his name is Travis King. Was uh, so he was a soldier, uh, U.S. soldier in South Korea. He was actually serving uh, a prison sentence. Reports say he was in serving a 50-day sentence for assault, and he also damaged a, a police car. He had gotten into some kind of altercation uh, with the locals, and so they he was released, and he was supposed to come back to the United States. He was supposed to board a flight to uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, where he was heading to Fort Bliss, but. When after his military escorts checked him into an American Airlines flight uh, in Incheon, you know, he texted them saying that he boarded the flight. But then he told 
the airline staff that he had lost his passport. So he uh, exited customs and immigration. And from there, the, the next thing we know is he, <clears throat> we, that we hear about his whereabouts is that he was, uh, he, he signed up or he got onto some tour for the demilitarized zone. This is uh, <clears throat> these tours that he do are near the joint security area at the border of North and South Korea. And when he was on this tour, he just took off and fled to North Korea. So that's, that's the gist of it. And again, I don't know the label either. Some have referred to this as a desertion, um, but, but he's in North Korea right now, and we haven't heard that much about his fate yeah. as of yet. So, I mean, before we uh, dive a little bit deeper into this, because as we both know, this gets very complicated very quickly. Um, the, uh, maybe you can just explain, like, how is it possible that you could be on a tour in the joint security area and you could just run across the, the MDL into, into North Korea? Right. Well, this is the big question that everyone has. First, how did he get onto the tour? Because usually you need to give an advance. Um, you need to fill out or, or sign up uh, a few days in advance, and they check your passports, and somehow he got on at the very last minute. But in terms of running across the border, I mean, this is the border is not very far. If you're in a group... Um, and th there are guards uh, on the UN on the South Korea side. They're uh, from the staff by the UN, and they're usually guards on the North Korea side. But because of COVID, the North Korean guards were not visible. But on the South Korean side, when he ran across, you know, we I don't know the distance, but uh, if you don't have an instant reaction to seeing someone running off, and he's a soldier, so he was probably in decent shape, it's, uh, you could quickly just traverse to the other side if nothing is stopping you there. So it's not, it's not impossible that he could have just fled, but uh, it's not, I think because it wasn't fortified on the other side, there's no, there's uh, like a four feet you know, barrier, but there isn't a wall. He could just easily run across to the other side. And I should also mention lastly that since uh, 2018, there is a, an agreement between the two Koreas that they would keep that uh, area the joint security area, uh, they would have the soldiers unarmed there to, to, as a sign of de-escalation. And so no one was you know, pointing or shooting him on site. Actually, thank goodness, because he probably would have been shot by the North Koreans. But, but that's you know, how he was able to just run across the border. Yeah, yeah. So he was not in <clears throat> uniform. He was in plain clothes. Right, yeah, he right. was in plain clothes. Yeah. And then the, the one picture that has been publicized of the group He's in the picture. His back mm -hmm. is to the camera. But you can see they're not very far from the MDL, from the military demarcation line. They are you know, certainly within sprinting distance for him to get across the line. Um, the, um, um, it, it, I mean, it is. I mean, it's a question that I've often got because <clears throat> people don't understand. They, they hear that the border between North and South Korea is the most fortified border in the world. And yet they ask, how can this guy have run across? As you said, in the MDL, in this joint security area, um, there's, there's no physical barricades, right? There's no razor wire. There's no, there's no checkpoints. There are no physical barricades. And even though the process of crossing between the two sides, uh, there are all sorts of protocols, and it's very scripted. And Because I, when I was in government, I had to cross. Mm -hmm. And there are very strict rules, like you cannot... Like, we arrived early. You could not cross early. You go up to the line at a particular time. You know, the, someone comes up from the other side. You read something asking for m permission. The other side reads something. And then, you know, then you cross. Um, so it, there's a strict protocol for it. But in terms of physical barriers, there's nothing there. Yeah, when we think of the MDL, the, the demilitarized zone, we think about mines and right. barbed wires. Yeah. But at this point where they conduct these tours, the joint security area, none of that is there. They usually do have these guards. The guards do look intimidating. I remember when I was there, I didn't I would have never thought of running across the border, but um but yes, in this in this instance it was it was possible. Yeah, and the um uh the uh and unfortunately I don't think there are gonna be any more tours for a while. Um the because uh, I think he's Private King has probably ruined it for everybody else now that uh that I can't imagine. As you know, they let you go into that building, T2. Yeah. It's called T2, Temporary Structure 2. They let you go into that building where you can, in the building, walk to the walk other to side. Walk to the other side, right. And usually there are North Korean guards on the outside looking in. And you've seen lots of people take those pictures 
Uh, but I can't imagine from now on that they're even going to allow that. It's going to be it's going to be really really difficult. Anyway, um, so what was he? Is he so? Was he deserting? Is he defecting? Like what is what what is the? How would you describe the intention? Or do we know the intention behind his? I mean, we, it's all speculation at this point. And I know they've talked to some of his family members, and he had. I mean, it sounded like he was having a difficult night beforehand. He had a death in the family, I believe, a cousin. But the sort of the best explanation I've heard is that he didn't want, he was already in trouble with the authorities. He didn't want to head back to the U.S. and he just decided to make a run for it. Although I think the worst place you can make a run for it if you want to escape trouble is to head to North Korea because God knows what sort of uh, predicament he may be in now. So what happens from here from him now? Like, what do you think will happen to him? You know, what's the U.S. government going to do? What's the next step here? Right. So right now, I, I did. We did hear that the Korean People's Army and the UN Command, who has jurisdiction over uh, this area, have have communicated. They haven't given any news about his status, but it is you know from the U.S. side, they're going to try to get him released. They want to know uh, whether he's being uh, taken care of, that they, he's not in harm's way. <clears throat> but uh, right now, I mean, the U.S. government will also try to negotiate uh, some kind of release. And this is where the big question is. Is he going to be in North Korea for a while? Uh, th- during periods where there was diplomacy engagement in 2018, there was Americans that were <clears throat> detained. Uh, Bruce Lawrence was the most recent one in 2018. <clears throat> Excuse me. And mm-hmm. um, and they uh, they released him in, in a few weeks. It was, it was pretty early. But then others, we've seen uh, Otto Warmbier's case, who uh, was... Um, you know, imprisoned and, and detained in prison in 2015. You know, he didn't come out. And when he came out, he was in a coma. And of course, he uh, he passed away uh, a, a few days later. So we don't really know the fate, but he is a mi- he is in the military. So that may make a difference for the North Koreans. And uh, many have argued that because of his low rank, he doesn't have much value to the North Koreans. Um, but but we have to see, you know, we, we would hope that they would just return, uh, return and realizing that there isn't much that, that could be gained from him. He was already in trouble in South Korea. Why do they want to hold on to him? But, you know, based on past experiences, they could also try holding on for a bargaining chip. And this is where the Biden administration, may, Biden administration may be thinking about, you know, going beyond just uh, trying to gain the release of an American uh, soldier that they may try to use that as a way to perhaps uh, have broader discussions with the North Koreans, because there has been no diplomacy between the U.S. and North Korea since 2019. Yeah, it would be ironic, because in the past, the U.S. has sent envoys, as you know, to extract some of these people. Uh, President Clinton, went, former President Clinton, went to get the two journalists out, and Carter also went and brought out journalist Joe Yun went to bring back Otto Warmbier. But each of those times when the U.S. went, sent somebody, the instructions were to just focus on release of the individual. Don't right. talk about anything else. And so you're saying this time it could actually be the, the, yeah, the they flip may, of that. They may try to uh, bring in other issues beyond. Of course, the most important goal is uh, this, the release of an American citizen. And on the North Korean side, you're, you're right. They... We'll see what they tried to gain out of it, if anything, just uh, a highlight or a spotlight for the regime. And they might say this is a um, a generous gesture from the regime, even though this um, soldier violated protocol, we're still going to release him. But they may ask for a high level official. We, you mentioned you know, Bill Clinton or um, uh, Bill Richardson. You know, there have been uh, you know, former government officials uh, that have come to try to uh, win the release of Americans, and so they may ask for the same just to get something out of it. But right now, because we haven't heard much of a response from the North Koreans, it's uh, it's hard to say. The uh, be- you know because of the North Korean uh, you know deathly fear of COVID getting into the country, I can't imagine that this guy is in a in in a, in a very nice place right now. They probably have him isolated in some cell somewhere, airtight cell because they're so worried about COVID spreading in the country. 
um, uh, you know, and they'll probably keep him in there for like two, not, not I was going to say two weeks, more like two months. Yeah. Uh, to ensure that he's not uh, uh, contaminating anybody else. Yeah, that was one of the theories, too, why North Korea wasn't responding right away, that they're very uh, fearful of COVID still. They haven't uh, released their COVID-19 border lockdown yet. Um, And so they probably put him in quarantine in a cell. I'm sure he's by himself, isolated. Um, and we know the conditions are not great in North North Korea. So so there's... uh, some reason for concern for his well, uh, Travis King's well-being. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, I mean, that was certainly the story of the week uh, uh, last week, but it took a lot of attention away from other things that were happening on the peninsula. Uh, North Korea did some more missile tests, uh, and then, of course, we had the the first session of the NCG, the Nuclear Consultative Group, and the port calls by uh, U.S. nuclear submarines. So uh, let's start with the ballistic missile test. Anything new there or just the same old, same old? Yeah, well, same old, same old. But the timing, of course, was it happened when the U.S. had uh, sent uh, the USS Kentucky a nuclear nuclear, uh, capable submarine. And if the analysis shows that the fire, uh, these two uh, missiles that were fired towards the East Sea Sea of Japan, it was... Um, the similar distance to how far uh, a nuclear sub could launch uh, and, and strike North Korea. So some saw this as symbolic, saying that the North Koreans see what the U.S. is doing and they can match, uh, uh, you know, match the level of coercion of the United States. But let me just backtrack and say that this should have been the, the key story coming out of South Korea last week. Um, this was uh, out of the Washington Declaration that came from the the biden Yoon summit in April. And I think it was noteworthy that they decided to convene this nuclear consultative group, the NCG, meeting you know, less than three months after the declaration, because it showed a real intent and political will on both sides to uh, try to reassure uh, the South Koreans about uh, U.S. extended deterrence and protecting uh, the Korean Peninsula and South Korea from a North Korean attack. And, and of course, uh, it was also meant to reassure the South Korean public because of this, um, these higher level discussions uh, on nuclear issues that South, the South Korean government would tell the public or sh- show to the public that we do have these reassurances and therefore uh, the path to going nuclear is not, not a prudent one. So there are these concerns because South Korea, the South Korean public has become very uh, pro-nuclear in recent years, and that's something that the Biden administration is mindful for due to uh, concerns about nonproliferation. Yeah. And um, there, there was, I guess, a, there was a second um, submarine that uh, that visited South Korea uh, in the last day or so, I think. Yes, that was the USS Annapolis. So it, it uh, stopped in Jeju, uh, in Jeju Island. There's a naval base there. I don't know if that was originally scheduled. It sounded like it was there to for refueling. But the point is that it, it sends a clear message that these uh, strategic assets, which is what they're called, so nuclear capable submarines, are being deployed to the Korean Peninsula on a regular and frequent basis. And again, this is all visible signs of reassuring to the South Korean public that the U.S. is 100 percent behind their South Korean ally. Yeah, the uh, it, it's almost I mean, you hear some clamoring in among some voices in South Korea for either the return of uh, nu- U.S. nuclear weapons to the Korean Peninsula or, you know, South Korea going nuclear. I mean, this constant, what looks like it's going to be a constant rotation of strategic assets is almost like a <clears throat> virtual nuclear presence, um, yeah. um, which is, uh, as you said, designed to assure South Koreans. Um, um, I thought one of the interesting things out of the NCG uh, in the statements that they made was this point about uh, coordinating or joint planning or coordination with regard to South Korean f- conventional military capabilities mm-hmm. with U.S. nuclear capabilities. Is that something new or is that something that we've heard before? That's a good question. I'm not sure if we've heard that before in the South Korean context, perhaps with other allies uh, such as NATO. but. Um, in the past, the U.S. has been—it's it's pretty much been off limits in terms of what nuclear, what 
uh, U.S. nuclear planning would look like in terms of contingencies on the peninsula and how, you know, in what role the allies would play in that kind of nuclear contingency. But again, we should be clear that it's not that South Koreans would assist, they would not deliver any nuclear weapons. But the fact that South Koreans would also have a role, a conventional role in supporting the U.S. in a nuclear contingency plan. Um, again, I don't know if this is the first time, but I think that is, uh, I mean, that, that also is another sign or step forward, because in order for the South Koreans to know what to do, I think they would have to have some more information on the from the U.S. side about the nuclear planning. So again, I don't know the specifics, but the fact that South Korea is going to play a conventional role in a nuclear contingent planning suggests that they would receive more information from the U.S. side. Yeah, and I thought it was also interesting that in the different work streams they announced, they also um, one of the one of them had to do with security of information. You know, which has always been a challenge for the United States in in working with allies is that, um, you know, leaks. There, there's just there isn't the same level of operational security mm -hmm. that you see in the United States. You know, whether it's with Japan or Korea. So that to me was also a good sign because it shows that uh, the U.S. is willing to and wants to share a lot more but they have to ensure the security of the information that goes to the other side. Right, and that's something that the South Koreans have been asking for, for more transparency and information. So there may be more coming from the U.S. side yeah. um, moving forward. It's also, it was also, um, the, the level of this meeting was also quite significant, right? Yes, it was at the deputy level. So we had Kurt Campbell uh, representing the Biden administration. And then on the South Korean side, there was Kim Tae-ho, the deputy national security advisor. So the fact that it's not at a working level, and, and you know, there are different uh, mechanisms to for the U.S. and South Korea to talk about sort of military and war planning, but the fact that this was at a higher level, I think, is also um, important. It gives more visibility and attention to, to the issues. Yeah, because the other dialogues that they have now, things like uh, the the... Uh, EDD, right, the Extended Deterrence Dialogue, and then the other one is the KID, uh, I guess. These, I mean, these are important dialogues, but they are not, as you say, they are not at the level of senior White House official, yeah. senior YPO, Young's on Presidential Office official, um, which is also another important signal. Um, so I guess the, 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 big, the last and big question with regard to this is, you know, so, as, you know, this was all, as you said, it came out of the Washington Declaration. It was to address South Korean concerns about the credibility of extended deterrence. It was meant to demonstrate to North Korea um, the, um, the strength of the U.S. commitment and also the, that the, um, the nuclear deterrence was credible and capabilities were being improved. Does, did this NCG do that? Did it, did it accomplish that? I mean, only time will tell, but I think among f the strategic elites, so those who are uh, elites, the policymakers and the experts, I, in, in South Korea, I think it is, I think they are reassured. I think they're pleased to see the U.S. at least make these, um, from the South Korean point of view, concessions that, that the Americans are listening. I think that's the important thing, because in the past, when South Koreans say that they don't feel sufficiently reassured, I think you would at times get dismissive remarks from mm. uh, military, you know, military, U.S. military commanders from, from the administration, former government officials saying that this is just, you know, misplaced. And they would say, why can't South Koreans just trust the U.S.? But I think this time around, because of this Washington Declaration and the nuclear consultative group, uh, it's a sign that Washington is listening. Maybe we can't give everything that the South Koreans are asking for, but we are listening. We're trying to work together uh, cooperating with South Korea and trying to address uh, some of the insecurities they may be feeling. In terms of public opinion, I know after the Washington Declaration, it didn't, in terms of favorability towards um, acquiring their own nuclear capabilities or, or going nuclear, uh, that has not changed all that much. Perhaps we need to see some of the discourse or the rhetoric uh, changing around uh, from, from the top down, from the elites. Um, certainly, if, if a president's going to mention, well, we might reserve the right to uh, develop nuclear weapons down the road, that's not going to help that, uh, that discourse or the narrative. But perhaps that narrative can, can begin to slightly change. I don't think it's going to go down to zero as long as North Korea keeps um, testing or, or conducting these uh, provocative acts. But, um, but I do think that if we can get to a place where uh, the political leadership in South Korea talks about uh, cooperation, 
uh, about um, the U.S. being a trusted ally. Uh, I do think that that could change. Uh, that could change some of the sentiment in South Korea. Yeah, um, reassurance is never easy. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Um, when it comes to deterrence, it's always been this combination of capabilities and you know, sort of reassurance signaling. The capabilities are clearly there, right? The United States, the ROC, they have the capabilities, but this assurance and signaling part is much harder. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, well, uh, more to come on this, I'm sure. Um, that's uh, about all the time we have for today. So, Andrew Yo, thank you very much for joining us on The Impossible State. Thanks so much for having me here. Yep. And uh, uh, to our listeners and viewers, we'll see you again on the next episode. Thanks very much. 